The subject of this uh, video is going to be a book. The t title of the book is called uh, Time to Start Thinking, America in the Age of Descent, as in going down, descending. Um, and it's by a uh, British journalist uh, named uh, Luce. And, uh, well, you can see there, Edward Luce. And um, it's basically about all what's wrong with America. And let me uh, let me be fr uh, frank and upfront. Uh, there's a lot wrong. <laughs> uh, the economy is not going well. Congress is corrupt. Uh, the electoral system is corrupt. Uh, well, this is in this is my opinion. Uh, there's way too many poor people in this country, and we got incredibly filthy rich people who I don't really think deserve that money that they supposedly get or they get um, especially on Wall Street but let me go over this book um, time to start thinking America in the age of descent um, uh, let me start reading the blurbs uh, on the back of the book loose paints a highly disturbing picture of the state of American society and of the total failure of American elites to come to grips with the real problems facing the country. It rises far above the current political rhetoric um, by its measured reliance on facts rather than canned ideological posturing <laughs> to reach its conclusions. That's that's on the back of the book by Francis Fukuyama. He's a, I don't know, he's a uh, professor in the uh, in California has written several books. Here's another blurb. Uh, warning: This book could be a danger to your peace of mind. Uh, one of the finest journalists of our times, Ed Luce, has crisscrossed the United States, uh, trying to understand what ails the country and what must be done. His conclusions are highly disturbing and may sometimes set uh, your teeth at edge. Uh, but they. Uh, but they are a must read. Uh, once again, a visitor to, to these shores has written a masterful portrait of America. That's by David Gergen. Um, let me see. Let me. I'll read one more blurb. Americans need friends who will tell us what we need to hear and how to think about the troubles, many of our own making, that threaten our democracy, prosperity, uh, and leadership in the world. We. We've got uh, just such a friend in uh, Ed Luce. Okay, and uh, each chapter in the book uh, tackles a, a different uh, problem. And here I'll just go over these chapters briefly so you get an idea. Um, first chapter is the, uh, the Lonely Middle, Why America's Middle Class Continues to Hollow Out. Uh, that's about the decline of the middle class. Uh, second chapter, um, Leave No Robot Behind, Why America's Educational System is Still Falling Behind. We know we haven't been investing in education, and uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a mess. We don't have standards. We, we're not serious about educating the, uh, our children. Uh, then the third chapter, The Golden Goose, Why America's Lead in innovation can no longer be taken for granted. Um, that's about uh, innovation, technology, and, and, the, and corporate leadership. Um, then chapter what four uh, is Gulliver's travel uh, travails. <laughs> Why uh, the bureaucracy is harming American competitiveness. Ah, and then this one you'll all be f familiar with, uh, the next chapter, Against Itself, Why America is Becoming Less Governable. Okay, the next chapter, um, Maybe We Can't, uh, Why Money Continues to Rule in Washington. Uh, and I've been I've been doing this uh, saying this on numerous of my videos, which I I don't I call their our present system a plutocracy, uh, a rule by the rich and the powerful and the corporations. It's not really a democracy anymore, especially after the the Citizens United decision, uh, which is going to funnel 
a billion, uh, probably a billion dollars or two billion dollars into the next, next campaign. Then the last chapter is kind of, um, well, not, not kind of grim. It says, an exceptional challenge. Why the coming struggle to halt America's decline faces long odds. Now, I haven't read the book yet. I, I just got it today. Um, so I, I'm, I'm already in agreement with a lot of what he, what he says. Uh, I don't, I haven't gotten into the details of these th uh, things, and I may do another video on this. Um, uh, there's a couple things. Well, there's another thing that he didn't mention, uh, which uh, we're facing, uh, which is we don't have cheap oil. Uh, we don't have cheap energy anymore. In the good old days, uh, oil, uh, gasoline was what? A quarter a gallon? 30 cents a gallon? So you could build big cars, and you could waste energy, and and oh, and we have global warming that's probably g going to cause problems. So as energy continues to go up in price, and the economy slows uh, because you need you need cheap energy. You really need cheap energy to to um, uh, cheap energy helps to create a create an economic expansion. Um, so uh, yeah, I recommend that book. Um, and uh, let me, oh, I can read one. Uh, this is uh, an over, uh, overview of the book at, uh, at Barnes & Noble. Um, Luce turns his attention to a number of uh, different key issues that are set to affect America's position in the world order. The changing structure of the U.S. economy, the continued polarization of American politics, the debilitating effect of the permanent election campaign, um, the challenges involved in the overhaul of the country's public education system, and the health or sickliness of American innovation and technology and business. Um, and then he talks about, well, the decline of our position in, in relation to the rest of the world and the rest of the world's economy. Um, while many Americans believe that their country can and should re retain its status as a global superpower, uh, Lou sees this as an increasingly unlikely scenario unless Americans, Americans themselves can stand up against the country's increasingly plutocratic character. Plutocratic. Plutocracy. <laughs> we don't have a democracy anymore. We have a corrupt plutocracy run by money. Um, America has bounced back successfully from uh, the shocks of the Great Depression and the Soviet launch of Sputnik, but Luce wonders if uh, the next crisis in America, American confidence may knock it off the top dog position for good. Um, okay, well, uh, that's uh, that's about all I can say about the, uh, the book, <laughs> and uh, I'll be reading it, and maybe I'll do another uh, video on it, and I recommend it. Uh, you know, the next election isn't going to solve... These are long-term problems, and it doesn't matter who's president. If if oh if the right wing, if you guys get uh, uh, Romney in there, and oh man, oh man, Romney's in there, the businessman, the great businessman, uh, who's going to cut regulation and cut government back, and it's not going to make any difference. He's facing a huge deficit. the The economy is still going to be uh, stuck in low gear. Um, so whatever. Uh, these are long-term problems, and uh, and we got the huge de uh, uh, deficit, of course, which Romney isn't talking about, and he, neither is Obama, but the huge deficit and how how we solve that huge deficit. Uh, how uh, but, well, whatever. Okay, I'm stopping. Uh, read the book. Yeah, bye. book review of, it is even worse than. It looks, how the American constitutional system collided with the new. Politics of Extremism. By Thomas E. Mann and Norman J. Arnstein. Mann and Arnstein have decided, in the writing of their book, that the time has come to abandon the even-handedness, that always gives both sides of an argument equal weight. This is the reporting style fashionable among most American, political, journalists. The author's principal conclusion is unequivocal, today's Republicans in 
Congress behave like a parliamentary party in the style of the British Parliament, a winner-take-all system. The Republican Party has become ideologically polarized, internally unified, vehemently oppositional. These Republicans have become more loyal to party than to country, the authors write. So, the political system has become grievously hobbled. At a time when the country faces unusually serious problems and grave threats, the country is squandering its economic future and putting itself at risk because of an inability to govern effectively. Mann and Ornstein rightly blame the news media for doing a mediocre job in covering this change in the Republican Party, the most important political story of the last three decades, the story of the transformation of the Republican Party into a party of extremists and ideologues. Today's Republican Party has little in common even with Ronald Reagan's GOP, or with earlier versions that believed in government. Instead it has become an insurgent outlier, ideologically extreme, contemptuous of the inherited social and economic policy regime, scornful of compromise, unpersuaded by conventional understanding of facts, evidence, and science, and dismissive of the legitimacy of its political opposition. All but declaring war on the government, Mann and Ornstein consider the debt ceiling fiasco of last summer. Proof of these accusations. The idea of deliberately jeopardizing the credit rating of the United States by toying with a purposeful default. On the country's debt was a carefully planned strategy, they note, the brainchild of Eric Cantor of Virginia, today's majority leader of the House, Mann and Ornstein quote John Behnor from late 2010, we're going to have to deal with the debt ceiling as adults. Whether we like it or not, the federal government has obligations, and we have obligations on our part. Cantor disagreed. When the new Republican House majority convened at a Baltimore retreat in January 2011, Cantor implored them to use the coming debt limit vote as their golden opportunity. They quote Cantor in a story in the Post that revealed this episode, quote, I'm urging you, Republican House members, to look at a potential increase in the debt limit as a leverage moment when President Obama will have to deal with us and accept deep spending cuts, book review of, it is even worse than, it looks, how the American constitutional system collided with the new, politics of extremism, by Thomas E. Mann and Norman J. Arnstein. The reviewer is Robert Kaiser. President Obama's campaign manager Jim Messina recently met with a group of Wall Street donors. The Wall Street donors gave Messina an earful. For the next hour, the donors relayed to Messina what their friends had been saying. They felt unfairly demonized for being wealthy. They felt scapegoated for the recession. One of the Wall Streeters raised his hand. He knew how to solve the problem. President Obama had won plaudits for his speech on race during the last campaign, the Wall Streeter noted. It was a soaring address that acknowledged white resentment and urged national unity. What if President Obama gave a similarly healing speech about class and inequality? What if he urged an end to attacking the rich for being so rich? Around the table, some people shook their heads in disbelief, one rich donor said. Quote, this administration has a more contemptuous view of big money and of Wall Street than any administration in 40 years, and it shows, unquote, where, where, where to begin? Wall Street excess help led to the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, inflicting untold economic suffering on millions and millions of Americans. In both rhetorical and substantive terms, the Obama administration's response was by any reasonable measure moderate and restrained. Indeed, Obama clearly viewed himself as a buffer between Wall Street and rising populist passion telling a group of bankers in April of 2009, quote, my administration is the only thing between you and the pitchforks, unquote.
A couple of months ago, I retired from my job on Capitol Hill. But I could see as early as last November that the Republican Party would use the debt limit vote, a routine legislative procedure that has been used 87 times since the end of World War II in order to concoct an entirely artificial fiscal crisis. Then, the Republicans would use that fiscal crisis to get what they wanted by literally holding the United States and global economies as hostages. The debt ceiling extension is not the only example of this sort of political terrorism. Republicans were willing to lay off 4,000 Federal Aviation Administration FAA employees, 70,000 private construction workers and let FAA safety inspectors work without pay, in fact, forcing them to pay for their own work-related travel. This was done to strong-arm some union-busting provisions into the FAA reauthorization. Everyone knows that in a hostage situation, the reckless and amoral actor has the negotiating upper hand over the cautious and responsible actor because the latter is actually concerned about the life of the hostage, while the former does not care. It should have been evident to clear-eyed observers that the Republican Party is becoming less and less like a traditional political party in a representative democracy and becoming more like an apocalyptic cult or one of the intensely ideological authoritarian parties of 20th century Europe.